John Minnelli knew he was in trouble. The cave diver was trying not to panic, but it was hard not to, considering he no longer had his rebreather attached to his back. His rebreather was the only thing that could keep him alive, as he had been in an underwater cave for hours, and the breathing device allowed him to recycle the oxygen in his exhaled breath. He struggled to maneuver through the tight passageway with his extra breathing tank gripped tightly under his arm. He cursed himself for not listening to his diving partners who told him his equipment was too large. But how did he get here? And more importantly, how did it end? This is his story. Welcome to Little Serbia. Nestled in the Jura Mountains is Moot, a small but inviting town in eastern France, located on the Swiss border. The city has a staggering population of 1,019 in 2021. The city is quiet and not known for much other than its extreme temperatures. In the summer months, the highs can reach 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, while the average winter is negative 6 degrees Celsius to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit but the record low is negative 41.2 degrees Celsius or negative 42.2 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the nickname Little Serbia comes from. But if you venture about a mile outside the town, one can find the Source de Dou. The Dou is a 281 mile or 453 kilometer river in Eastern France that flows into Switzerland, but more importantly, has a vast underground cave system. Sitting at the foot of Mount Razou in Le Gros Rock, this cave system is hidden in a heavily forested area, and its naturally blue clear waters have been a draw to the surrounding community for decades. The temperatures are not the only consideration here, but also the heavy rainfall, which plays a pivotal role in the water levels that affect the dive. If water exceeds 0.06 meters cubed, diving is prohibited as the tight restrictions and obstructed visibility all proved to be risks that the French authorities deemed to be too dangerous. And as expected, one must have a permit to legally dive at this location. Many experts have desperately tried to find the source of the water, but to no avail. It is a mystery that continues to attract divers with a strong curiosity to undercover nature's secrets. The winding passageways and complex network weave their way through the limestone rocks, making one's equipment size an important factor. I would not advise you to dive at this location if you suffer from claustrophobia. The cold temperatures are also a major consideration as dry suits are needed or else you risk hypothermia. This type of equipment normally requires extra training, as it is more complex than simply putting on the gear. The first recorded dive of the cave was first documented in 1969 by two Swiss cave divers, J.C. Fracco and P. Petroquin, and I apologize for any mispronunciation. The duo was interested in finding the source of the 3 by 4 meter spring. They entered the water and dove to a depth of 5 meters. At the bottom, the passage leads through a vertical crack where one can surface just after swimming 45 meters. This section is called S1. The two Swiss divers felt comfortable continuing deeper into the cave, and to do so they had to pass a small restriction or a narrow passage that is difficult to pass through. After traversing this section, they found themselves in a new area named S2. At this point, the depth was only 3.5 meters, and it was a straightforward dive. The pair would continue forward for about 13 meters, where they encountered an upper edge that serves as a ledge. Here they stopped, as the cave no longer was a horizontal passageway, but more so a vertical shaft, leading into the depths of the earth. There is a section in S2 where divers can still surface, and this would be the last safe point in the dive. The men would return to the entrance and report their findings, only building the curiosity of the cave. It would not be until many years later when an Italian diver, Saint Lecco, would begin to push the boundaries of the cave. Research indicates that he entered the spring alone, following the same path the Swiss divers took, first navigating through the vertical crack in S1, 
then passing the tight restriction in S2. And within a few meters, he was standing on the ledge, looking down into the pitch black depths of the cave. Saint Leko would have to gather his courage as he stepped over the ledge and began sinking into the next section called S3. He would drift down for about 18 meters before encountering a small, horizontal offset, almost like a zigzag before the shaft floor immediately drops back into the depths. Here, he would find out the shaft would reach a depth of about 53 meters, where it expanded to a large collapse hall. The floor was covered in rocks and other blocking materials. Here he would stop and return to the surface to document his findings. From the sections of S1 to S3, it was reported that there was little sediment to block visibility. In fact, the walls were essentially washed clean and there was no percolation. But when Saint Leko reached the depths of about 50 meters, this changes. The heavy deposits make it difficult to see, especially if one is using fins or scooters without the correct technique. In S3, it is very easy to kick up the sediment, creating clouds of zero visibility, increasing the difficulty and risk of the dive. Additionally, using an open circuit system caused strong percolation. This just meant that exhaled gas bubbles being actively released into the water lead above the diver, colliding with the cave ceiling. A diver typically wants to avoid this, as particles of rock can become dislodged, restricting visibility, and in worst cases, causing a cave-in. This was a big reason why Saint Leko turned around at this section, but what he didn't realize is that there was more of the cave to be discovered. Nevertheless, his dive only increased the curiosity of other divers. Only two years later, the legendary Swiss cave diver Jean Jacques Ballons, who was responsible for creating the first modern diver's watch, became interested in the source de Doux. Saint Leco's findings intrigued him, and he believed there was more to be discovered. He was right. There was almost nobody else more qualified than Ballons. He was an avid cave diver who pushed the boundaries of what is possible in the sport. At the time of his dive, he would have over 25 years of experience, but what he particularly loved was the exploration of the unknown. And being the one to find the source of the spring was an attraction he could not pass up. Bolanz was an expert in topography and planned to map the cave to the best of his ability. Additionally, he always kept an open mind to use new diving equipment, which proved to be an advantage. Bolanz would set out in the freezing cold water, dive down five meters, and quickly enter the vertical crack leading to S1. He made quick work of the cave and soon found himself in S2, appearing into the black abyss just like all the other divers that came before him. He would bring rope, called a dive line, with him, and begin laying it out from the end of S2 onwards. This would help him find his way out of the cave in case of low visibility. Down he went, deeper and deeper, until he stopped at the zigzag section of S3. He quickly traversed this and made his way further into the depths, until he reached the final location of Saint Leko's dive. The passage opened up into a larger cavern, just as described by Saint Leko. There were razor-sharp rocks, and Boulans took note of this, as he did not want to nick his suit. To the right of him was a narrow crack too small for him to enter with a side mount. Instead, he turned left and continued to the end of the hall, where he discovered a slightly hidden passageway at the bottom of the floor. Boulans had to pass through a tight restriction between collapsed blocks about 165 meters from the entrance. The horizontal passage began to open up, about four meters wide and five meters high. The path ran directly under the Rizu, a large wooden section of the Ura Mountains. The rock had beautiful fossils visible to Balanz as he slowly ventured further into the cave. Using his experience, the diver expertly kicked his fins carefully in order to not stir up loose sediment under him. He would encounter different collapse zones where boulders blocked the passage, but they were not too tight and fairly easy to pass through. In total, there were four sections that Balanz had to squeeze through. He would make it all the way to 322 meters, or 1,056 feet from the cave entrance before he was forced to stop. There was a fall zone that proved to be too tight to continue with his current equipment, which was an open air system. The only possible way one could continue is if they were using a side mount. 
Nevertheless, Balans would turn around and map the cave. His discovery and information proved to be invaluable in the later years. Over the years, many divers would venture into the cave, but none would be as successful as Balans for over a decade, indicating how impressive his dive truly was. The 2000s opened up a new chapter in the cave, and a race to discover its mystery. On November 18th, John Volanden, a seasoned cave diver and rescuer who played a leading role in the infamous 2018 Ta Luang Cave Rescue, would enter the water using a side mount. He quickly passed S1 and S2 before diving down the shaft of the cave where he reached 53 meters. John would follow the left passageway entering the tight restriction and found himself in the open corridor. This restriction was actually made larger in 2002 and 2003 with a hammer and a chisel in an attempt to make it safer. He would pass the four collapsed zones and reach the turning point of Balans. But John would not stop, and with the proper equipment, he continued deeper into the cave. The passage would occasionally have narrow points due to large boulders blocking the clear path. John would eventually swim an additional 145 meters past Balanza's final stopping point. Satisfied, he would turn around and return home with his discovery. Realizing there was more cave to discover, divers took interest in the source to do, as the race of discovery had already been kick-started. Only a year later after John's dive, Andre Gluer and Pedro Bellardi entered the cave and followed the exact same path as their predecessors. They eventually reached the location of John's turnaround. The duo had been laying their own line, so now there were two guide ropes up to this location but this time they ventured deeper into the cave, reaching a new distance of 472 meters from the entrance. Similar to the divers before them, they would return and report their findings. John Minnelli learned about the source Dadu and the allure of having his name etched in the cave's history, and it was too attractive to pass up. John would set out to venture into the cave only 18 days after Andre Glur and Pedro Bellordi's first dive. He would be accompanied by two trusted friends. They all planned to dive independently of each other, but would be in the cave at the same time, otherwise known as autonomous diving. John Minnelli was also known to have a sharp and curious mind. Born in 1976 in the UK, he excelled academically and absorbed knowledge at an incredible rate. Growing up, he loved open-air life and joined the Scouts. In adulthood, John found himself working as a consultant for engineers specializing in solving complex issues that others could not. But outside of work, he developed a love for thrilling adventures. First, it was long motorcycle rides until his life changed when he experienced a bad accident in 1999 that left him with a broken back. This injury would come back to haunt him. After recovery, he would focus on his other hobby, scuba diving. He quickly became hooked on the sport, and it would not take long before he joined the British Sub Aqua Club, where he was a reliable member. His thirst for exploration was the main reason he loved scuba diving, but it was not enough. He still felt like something was missing. John began diving into wreck sites and would partake in holidays, where he pushed his diving club buddies to join him. It was during these times he really developed his skills and learned how to be a safe diver. But still, John wanted more. In order to explore challenging dive sites, John underwent specialized training, including how to use a rebreather device. This opened up new doors for him, as he could go to depths he previously could not reach. He would take advantage of this in exploring deeper wrecks. Pushing his limits fascinated him, and his curiosity to learn led him to cave diving, specifically in the UK and France areas. Although John's adventures proved to be too dangerous to some, he would always make time for his diving buddies. On a regular basis, he would dive with his friends in the sea as he really valued the camaraderie. John would tell them of his underground explorations, proudly discussing his achievements. He lived his life on the edge. He was always careful and extremely competent, fully understanding his abilities and having a deep grasp of how his equipment worked. 
The night before the dive, John, along with his two friends, were discussing the cave and preparing themselves for what was to come. John Minnelli was warned that his rebreather was too big to fit in some of the tight restrictions and that he should not push himself or attempt the dive with a different device. Minnelli would not listen though, and the next day, one by one, they dove into the cold water and reached the vertical crack. John entered the tight restriction with little difficulty and made his way through S1. Admiring the clear water, he was careful not to get stuck or caught up on the sharp rocks. The depth was shallow at about 3.5 meters. It did not take long before he had to traverse the next tight restriction, which led him into S2. John passed a few rocks and stepped on the ledge, peering into the dark water below him. He took a deep breath, swung his foot over the edge, and began lowering himself. The water quickly turned dark as the sunlight no longer reached him. Instead, he would heavily rely on his flashlights that he brought with him. He made his way down the vertical shaft, reaching the depths of 18 meters before transitioning to the next drop. He was slow with his movements, carefully navigating the cave with complete concentration. Once he reached the bottom of the shaft at about 54 meters, John took note of the right entrance, but could tell immediately he was too large to enter. There was a significant amount of sediment coming from the hole, so instead John turned and shifted his focus to the left. Near the floor was the tight restriction that led to the horizontal pathway deeper into the cave. Luckily, the passage had been enlarged in 2002, which made entering the restriction easier. John was careful and executed his training well. He took note of his depth gauge and air supply, but was not worried, as all his checks were positive. After traversing this section, he felt relieved and excited to continue. Further and further, John moved away from the cave entrance, passing obstructing boulders and large debris. Overall, the dive was extremely successful up to this point. He would continue for about 200 more meters before reaching approximately 555 meters, or 1,821 feet from the cave entrance. Here he reached a major collapse with large amounts of gravel accumulated on the bottom of the floor. The obstructions proved to be too insurmountable for John to pass, but he was happy with his progress. It was time to turn back anyways. His gas supply had reached one third of its use, and following the dive rule of thirds, a safety measure in cave diving, he wanted to ensure that there was plenty of supply left on his return. John slowly made his way back to the cave entrance, and before long was nearing the small restriction required to traverse before traveling up the shaft. He had struggled to pass this section when entering, but John now struggled even more than before when trying to exit. His rebreather was simply too big to fit through the hole. Instead, John took off his equipment from his back, transitioned his breathing to his extra gas supply bottle that he was holding with his arm and squeezed his way through successfully. He pulled his equipment through the hole but as he tried to put it back on, he could not. The cave's tight spaces and his pre-existing back injury from his motorcycle accident prevented him from maneuvering himself correctly. It was hard not to panic, but John did his best as he was an experienced diver and knew to remain calm. With limited options, John decided he needed to continue without his rebreather. Instead, he tucked the extra gas supply bottle under his arm and began to swim towards the cave entrance. He slowly ascended towards the surface, and despite the panic situation, his solution was working until about halfway up the shaft. His rubber hose attached to the air supply became loose to his mouthpiece and detached. His bottle was dropped. Still a considerable distance from the surface, John no longer had an air supply. In a last ditch effort, he looked for the missing bottle frantically but to no avail. John's diving companions waited on the surface for him, but when he failed to return, the concern for his safety grew. Emergency services were called and a team was put together to investigate. Their worst fears were confirmed when John's lifeless body was found trapped under a ledge 26 meters down the main shaft. John had drowned at the age of 32. Although John Minnelli's story would end here, the source to do story continues. 
Following dives continued to push the boundaries of the cave. Andre Glor and Pedro Bellardi would return and continue to push their limits. They would reach a total distance of 1,050 meters at a depth of 82 meters on August 30th, 2009. 15 days later, Pedro would dive again and reach the distance of 1,395 meters from the entrance at a depth of 92 meters. This appeared to be the maximum distance allowed by the cave. In order to reach this distance, he had to traverse many tight restrictions, with some areas even scraping his back and stomach. Divers took note that after 555 meters, there were more collapsed zones. There were also several different chimney hall sections that led to dead ends and even tighter restrictions that were simply not possible to enter. Diving today at the Source de Duz has lost some of its appeal, as the cave's maximum distance is believed to be achieved. It is a seven and a half hour dive in freezing water that make further exploration difficult. There are many narrow and shallow passageways that pose risk to equipment, and due to the nature of the cave, rescues are near impossible. Nevertheless, divers today still make the journey to explore the various chimneys, and small additional passageways. Despite the inherent dangers of cave diving, the need for exploration drives some to the extreme.